Welcome to God's Word Only. This is lesson four. For the first three lessons, we've looked at the grace, the power, and the love of our God and everything that he has done for us. Lesson four is no different. Lesson four is on baptism. Baptism is often misunderstood, a lesson and a topic that many people misunderstand. But here we're going straight to God's word and God's word only. The issue that we need to deal with today is loneliness. Many people feel lonely in this world, not just because they truly are alone, because sometimes people feel lonely when plenty of people are around. Loneliness on the inside, separation from God himself, an inability to find the peace and the comfort and the acceptance that everyone wants and everyone needs. Baptism is actually going to fix this issue, and we're going to see how. Story time is about a jailer. A jailer back in the day in the city of Philippi. Story starts at midnight. Midnight in a dungeon. The apostle Paul and his companions had been arrested the day before because of some jealous Jewish leaders. They were taken in front of the magistrates, the authorities of the town, and the authorities promptly stripped them of their clothes and brutally scourged them. They then threw them into jail for the night to decide what they were going to do with them the next morning. The jailer was in charge of keeping these criminals at bay, and so he threw them into an inner cell and put their feet in the stocks. Around midnight, Paul and his companions were praying out loud, and they were singing hymns together, despite the brutality and the torture they had just experienced. When all of a sudden, an earthquake hit, an earthquake from the Lord, the prison cells burst open, and the chains that had been chaining their hands and their feet broke off. The jailer rushed in to see what happened. He saw that the doors were wide open, And he drew his sword to kill himself. Apparently, he realized that if he had let the jailer, if he had let the prisoners go, his life would be on the line. But before he could harm himself, Paul called out to him, don't harm yourself. We're still here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in, saw everyone was still in their cells. And he asks Paul an interesting question. What must I do to be saved? We don't know what, if anything, the jailer knew about God or Jesus or the Bible leading up to that night. He must have heard them praying and singing hymns, however. And he asked them a very important question. What was Paul's answer? You don't have to do anything. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. And then Paul spoke to this jailer about Jesus. and Everything Jesus had done and everything Jesus had promised him. And the jailer took Paul and his companions and he washed their wounds that night. And then the jailer and his entire household was baptized. Baptism in his in- It's a fascinating part of God's word. And this story ends and the jailer's life really begins with baptism. But what is it? And what does it do? Baptism really consists of two main elements, the water and the word. When those two are combined, something miraculous happens. Because that's exactly what the Lord has promised. So let's look at a few passages to see what the Lord says about this wonderful gift. First passage is from the book of Acts. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, here is water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? Now, I understand we're jumping into the middle of a different story here. But the point is, they came across some water along the side of the road. So it could have been a pond or a lake or a river or a stream or a puddle or a ditch. And this man says, well, why shouldn't I be baptized? There's water right here. That's the first 
element that makes baptism, baptism. It's water. What kind of water? Well, it's not holy water and it's not special water. It's just plain water. That's the point. There is nothing unique about this water used in baptism. The power is not in the water. The power is in the promise of God. That leads us to the second important element of baptism. As from Matthew chapter 28, Jesus said, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Jesus gives us a very specific way that we should baptize. Baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So when the water and those words are combined, baptism happens. It can't be any other words, and it cannot be any other element than water. It has to be water in these words because this is a direct command from Jesus himself. The water and the word, nothing more. Now, you may have seen baptisms before. You may have been baptized yourself. Sometimes there are a lot of other things that happen in and around, before and after an actual baptism. But to make baptism baptism, all you need is water and God's word that he tells us to say. So it could be submerging, dunking, pouring, spraying, or sprinkling. doesn't really matter how a baptism is performed because the word baptism simply means to wash with water. As long as one of those forms is combined with the specific words of God, baptism has happened. But what does baptism do? Maybe in other words, why do we baptize? It's not just a church ritual. It's more than simply tradition. God gives us some incredible blessings in baptism, and they cannot be overlooked. The first most important blessing is from Acts chapter 2. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to create a list here of the gifts of baptism, and that first gift is forgiveness, the real forgiveness, not just a reminder of forgiveness, the real forgiveness that Jesus won for you on the cross, he gives to you in baptism. Now, when Jesus died on the cross, he forgave the sins of every person who has ever lived, but he had to get that gift of forgiveness to you in some way. He has chosen to give it to you through God's word that you read or that you hear. Baptism, and in the next lesson, we're going to see the Lord's Supper is the third way that he chooses to deliver this forgiveness to you. For now, we see this gift of forgiveness through baptism. Another gift that was given in that passage was the gift of the Holy Spirit. So not only forgiveness, but also the Holy Spirit himself. Now, this might be a little harder to understand on the surface, so we have to talk about what is the gift of the Holy Spirit. In short, the gift is faith. This is how we know that Jesus lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. How do we know who Jesus is, what he has done, and what he has promised us? Well, by the gift of the Holy Spirit. The gift of the Holy Spirit is faith. So baptism gives us forgiveness, and it gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit to believe it. What an incredible blessing baptism is, but that's not all. In 1 Peter chapter 3, we see baptism now saves you. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus saves you. How? One of the ways is through baptism, because he gives you forgiveness and the gift of the Holy Spirit through baptism. So baptism is a means through which God saves you. It connects you with Jesus' death and his resurrection. So it's not something different than Jesus. It's not another way to be saved other than Jesus. It's the exact same way 
through faith in Jesus. How do you get faith in Jesus? One of the ways is through baptism. Gift of baptism number three, salvation. Baptism is hugely important, giving us these monumental blessings of the Lord. In Galatians chapter 3, we read that you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Remember the issue we're dealing with today is loneliness. You don't ever have to feel lonely again. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And it says sons here, not sons and daughters, because sons back in that culture received the entire inheritance. You are God's son in that way, whether you are a male or a female. You are going to receive the entire inheritance from your father, and that inheritance is heaven. And as a son that will receive the inheritance, you have been clothed like a son. You're not clothed like a servant. You're not clothed like an employee. You're not clothed even like a friend. You are clothed as the heir apparent. You are clothed as the son of God himself. That is gift of baptism number four. You are clothed with Christ as if he were on you like a robe so that when your Lord looks at you, he doesn't see the filthy, nasty, dirty sinner. He sees Christ on you, pure and perfect and holy. In Romans chapter six, we have another blessing of baptism. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. What a powerful picture. In your baptism, you were buried with Jesus in his tomb. Jesus died separating himself from the effects of sin. In baptism, you die with him, separating yourself from the eternal effects of sin. And of course, because Jesus rose, you will one day rise as well. And in fact, right now, you are living a new life in him. The gift of baptism, number five, you were buried with Jesus into his death. Titus chapter 3 tells us that he saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. This is a fancy way of talking about baptism. He saved us through baptism, and baptism is described as a rebirth. You are born again. Now, a lot of people use that phrase, born again, probably not in the best or most scripturally accurate of ways. This is a biblically accurate way. You were reborn through baptism, born through faith in Jesus. That is the next gift of baptism. You were reborn. It's a rebirth in him. Finally, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we were all baptized by one spirit into one body. Not only are you a son of God, adopted into his family, but you're also brought into the body of Christ. This is an important concept. When you're baptized, you're not baptized Catholic. You're not baptized Lutheran. You're not baptized Presbyterian. You're not baptized Methodist. When you're baptized, you're baptized Christian. You're baptized into the body of Christ. You have brothers and sisters in Christ all around the world whom you've never met and you never will meet until you reach the heavenly home of paradise where you will see them for the first time. Finally, get the baptism that we have in the Bible is that you're baptized into one body of Christ. You are not alone. You are not on your own. You have a massive family, both on this earth and in heaven, waiting for you. So is baptism something we do for God or something God does for us? 
Hopefully, after we've looked at a bunch of different verses in the Bible, you see that baptism is definitely something God does for us. It's not something we do for God. Some people have the mistaken notion that baptism is the point at which we dedicate our lives to God. Now that can't be further from the truth. Baptism is the point where God dedicates his life to us. He gives us blessing upon blessing upon blessing upon blessing. What an incredible gift that the Lord gives us. We do nothing. God does everything. But who should be baptized? That's a big question and a hotly debated question and has been for centuries. So let's look at what Jesus says. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Who does Jesus say we should baptize? All nations. Who does all nations exclude? No one. Who does all nations include? Everyone. So if there's a group of people or an individual person that someone says shouldn't be baptized, they'd better have a good reason for it. And of course, the argument or the discussion always are all revolves around babies. What about babies? Should they be baptized or shouldn't they? Let's walk through some common arguments about why babies shouldn't be baptized. Now, babies can't believe in Jesus yet. Can they? They don't even know what's going on. How could they possibly believe? We read from Luke chapter 18, people were also bringing babies to Jesus to have him touch them. Jesus called the children to him and said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Well, the kingdom of God can't belong to babies unless they believe in Jesus as their Savior. And we could have picked different passages, too. We have a passage in Psalm 71 that says, From birth I have relied on you. Suffice it to say that babies can believe. If you looked at or listened to Lesson 3 on faith, We talked a little bit about how faith and knowledge are two different things. Knowledge can only take you so far. Faith has to take you the rest of the way. Faith believes what knowledge can't understand. And if that's true, then babies can believe, especially since faith is also a gift from God. And if the Lord promises in baptism that he gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit, the gift of faith to believe it, why couldn't he give it to babies as well? Some people say, well, babies aren't sinful, are they? So why would they need baptism? Psalm 51 says, surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. People are sinful from the very moment they begin to exist. So, yes, babies are sinful. Parents can tell that right away. By observation and experience, you know that a baby is just thoroughly selfish through and through. But beyond our observation, the Bible is very clear. Everyone is sinful right away. So everyone needs baptism. Well, all babies go to heaven anyway, right? So what's the point? Why bother with baptism if babies go to heaven? But Jesus says, whoever believes in Jesus is not condemned. Whoever does not believe stands condemned already. Babies don't automatically go to heaven. Babies need to believe in Jesus as their Savior, just like adults need to believe in Jesus as their Savior. But if babies can't understand human words yet and comprehend the concepts behind those words, The only other way God promises to give the gift of faith to someone is through baptism. So although people say everyone should be baptized except for infants, we might argue that baptism is especially for infants. This is the one way that the Lord has established to bring little babies to faith in him 
and receive the forgiveness of sins. Well, don't people need to repent first? Someone might say, how can a little baby repent? We do read from the book of Acts, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you are received the gift of the Holy Spirit. But then Peter says, the promise is for you and your children. Notice that he doesn't say the command to repent, even though repentance itself is worked in your heart through the word of God. The promise is for you and your children. The promise is the promise of forgiveness and the promise of the gift of the Holy Spirit. So when we are talking to adults, yes, they should repent. They should admit that they are sinful and believe that those sins are forgiven. With a child who cannot yet respond, a child who cannot yet verbalize what they think or what they believe, the promise is still for these babies, these children, these infants. We would be spiritually negligent not to baptize a baby and offer them these gifts that the Lord promises. But where does the Bible say we should baptize babies? I don't find a passage in the entire page of the word that we should baptize babies. But Jesus does say, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. The same could be said about middle-aged black women or elderly Asian men or any other category of people that you would like to put in. Where does the Bible say that we should baptize middle-aged black women or baptized elderly Asian men. Well, you're not going to find a specific passage that says that, just like you won't find a specific passage that says you should baptize babies. But all of those categories of people would fall under what Jesus says here. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. Should babies be baptized? Absolutely. Why wouldn't we want to give these precious little people these incredible blessings that the Lord offers through the simple water and the word? A few questions that we have to deal with yet. Who can baptize? Who should baptize? Well, the answer is any Christian. God gives this command to Christians, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. So it can be a pastor, but it doesn't have to be. Any Christian can baptize someone else if they use water and the words, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Because the power is not in the person who is doing the baptizing. The power is in the promise that God connects to baptism. How many times should a person be baptized? Just once. God showers you with blessings in baptism. So even if a person rejects the Lord later on in life, that doesn't mean God's promises have failed. It means that person has failed. I think of it like this. The Lord showers those blessings on you like a rain shower in baptism. Let's say later on in life, that person rejects the Lord and turns away from him. It's as if the umbrella of unbelief goes up and they are blocking those blessings that are showering down in baptism. Later on, that person is brought back to faith in Jesus. The umbrella of unbelief comes back down and they are showered once again with the blessing that had always been there the entire time. They were just rejecting them through unbelief. You don't need to be baptized again. Being baptized again would be having a bucket of water thrown on you when you are already drenched in the pouring rain. You can't get any wetter. God's promises don't fail. So once is enough. Well, is baptism necessary? Can someone be saved without baptism? Well, for Christians, it's necessary because God says you're supposed to be baptized. But for God, it's not necessary. He reserves the right to save people apart from baptism. Some people sometimes use the example of the thief on the cross with Jesus. At first, he was mocking Jesus. And then later on, he says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. 
And Jesus says, today you're going to be with me in paradise. Well, this man didn't have a chance to be baptized up on the cross. I like the example, though, of every Christian in Old Testament times, whether it's Abraham or Moses or David or Ruth or pick your favorite biblical character in the Old Testament. None of them were baptized. Baptize, baptism didn't start until the time of John the Baptist and Jesus. But all those Christians are in heaven because they believed in Jesus as their Savior. So yes, God can and does save people apart from baptism. But for those of us who know what baptism is, hear God's command that we should be baptized, it is necessary. We don't have an option. We should be baptized. And in fact, even if there wasn't a command, we would want to be baptized because it takes us into God's family. It connects us with him in an incredibly powerful way. That's why baptism is so important. Because loneliness runs rampant in this world. There are times that all of us feel lonely and all alone and by ourselves. You don't have to worry about that anymore. You're a part of the family of God. You are a son and a daughter of the Lord through faith in him because you have been adopted by your Lord, chosen by him, and given, and given by him some incredible gifts through baptism. If you have questions about this lesson, please contact me on the information on the screen. Get into those online forum and see the questions that come up. Ask questions of your own, and I'll get back to you shortly. Hope you can tune in next time for Lesson 5.